Thank you very much, Arnold. Thank you all for coming. Hello, hola, bon dia, bonjour. <laughs> Covers all the bases. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. It's really fun to be here. I'm enjoying myself very much at the CREAF and enjoying Spain and Catalonia and, and Barcelona. Um, today I'm going to talk about some work, uh, some work that's been finished and some work that's in progress on uh, the mountain pine beetle. And I, I hope you'll forgive me for abusing this from genes to ecosystems phrase, but I think I actually will talk about genes all the way to ecosystems today. Um, as Arnold indicated, my background is in forest and landscape ecology. Um, I'm very inspired and compelled by images such as this. This is a large uh, picture of boreal forest in Northwest ter Territories in Canada. So this is, uh, you know, talk to Lewis uh, Cole's comment uh, a few weeks ago. This is a natural forest. This is what the natural forest looks like. Um, and we're interested in what drives these spatial patterns and abundance and diversity of tree species and wildlife habitat. Um, so this is, this is what gets me excited. Um, these types of landscapes, these forest landscapes, are shaped by uh, disturbances. And disturbance is any event that comes through and resets the successional stages of a forest. Uh, within Canada, uh, we've got just under 350 million hectares of forest land. And so this is this pale green square represents all of the forest land in Canada. And then here, this little column shows the disturbances that are annually affecting uh, the forest in Canada. The green are insect outbreaks, uh, about 18 million hectares, fire, one and a half million hectares, and forest management, so generally clear-cut logging, uh, somewhere under one million hectares. So, um, and this is just a snapshot from 2015, 2016, and these values will vary. But to show you that we've got lots of forest and a lot of disturbance, but not as much disturbance as we have forest. And most importantly, it's these insects that are affecting the largest area. It's the lar most significant disturbance of the, the forest. And I know if there are fire people, this sort of comment makes fire people angry because I say that insects are more important. They do affect more area, and it's a different type of influence, but just in the metric of area affected, insects are more important. Okay, fire guys, just calm down. <laughs> All right. Um, the insect I want to talk to you about today is the uh, mountain pine beetle. So this is a, a native species of bark beetle found in Western North America. And this is a beautiful photo of the type of uh, damage that they can cause. The, all the red, these are trees that have been killed by the mountain pine beetle. And this is just one snapshot from one flight. Uh, in total, about 18 million hectares have been affected in Canada. O over 6 million hectares in the U.S., generally in the high elevation pine ecosystems in the U.S. Um, and, and it's a big problem right now because it's, it's expanding its range and it's threatening other forest regions that have before now not been threatened. So in red, we have the historic mountain pine beetle range in Western North America. The blue is this novel extended range. Over the last decade, the mountain pine beetle has attacked lodgepole pine forests in Alberta and British Columbia, where we have no record of them attacking trees in the past. These orange arrows indica indicate uh, potential uh, migration paths of the mountain pine beetle into jack pine forest across the Canadian boreal forest here. It attacks lodgepole pine. This is jack pine. And we've been able to demonstrate that the mountain pine beetle is now successfully reproducing in jack pine as well. So we have a, a very serious threat to timber and forest resources, ecosystem functioning, and forest health at the scale of the entire boreal forest. Now, perhaps it's a bit, um, I'm being a bit excited by saying it threatens the entire forest, but we have no context. Uh, we have no record of the beetle being in these areas. So people are taking these risks very seriously if this insect could expand its outbreak range and begin affecting forests in uh, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and into Ontario. So I mentioned it a moment ago, the uh, mountain pine beetle, it's a native species. This is not an invasive that comes from we don't know where. This is a native species that has a very long history of outbreaks in North America. This is a... a, a, a paleo and dendrochronological reconstruction of mountain pine beetle outbreaks in, I believe, British Columbia. Uh, so going all the way back, they've got records of these outbreaks back to 1650. And of course, the, the resolution of these data get better as we move forward and we see these pulses of, uh, of outbreaks. So it's a quasi-cyclic. If you're a population dynamics guy, you'd say, no, it's not cyclic, it's episodic. Um, 
So I try to keep everyone happy in my talk. So, <laughs> so it's an episodic outbreaking species rather than a cyclic outbreaking species, but it, it has historical context. Um, and th this is what's really exciting or interesting about these species is that they both exhibit these really large scale patterns of spatial synchrony in their outbreaks. That is, they affect millions of hectares at the same time and they have this regularity to their outbreaks. They come and they go and they come and they go. So there are these large scale spatial temporal phenomena that influence how forests operate. Um, and that's the, the picture of the beast up close. This is Dendrochnus ponderosa. Um, and it's it's actually quite tiny. It's the, the size of a, a grain of rice. Okay, so these tiny species, and this is again and something that's exciting, these tiny species, their large population dynamics scale up to ecosystem level consequences. <clears throat> so it's not all bad. These species have a place in the forest ecosystem, of course. It's, a, it's a, an important agent of forest disturbance, an agent of renewal. Um, but currently this outbreak is larger than ever observed and it appears to be undergoing some sort of a range expansion. And I'll talk in the second half of this presentation, I'll talk a little bit about some ideas about what it is that's driving this range expansion and how it's managed to escape its historical constraints. Um, climate change and the legacies of forest management, that is large homogeneous stands of un uniform age. These are the, the culprits that have been implicated in, in resulting in this massive outbreak and this range expansion. And there are significant downstream effects on uh, timber supply, on community sustainability, uh, forest succession carbon, fire risk, water, and uh, biodiversity. So some very interesting biodiversity cascades associated with these, these large outbreaks. Um, and of course, the question of, of costs, these types of outbreaks are incredibly costly. The current outbreak has triggered over $500 million of direct investment from the Alberta government. Uh, in, in managing this, this problem. The estimated cumulative loss is somewhere around $57 billion uh, over the next 50 years in the province of British Columbia alone. Now British Columbia produces a lot of wood. Their economy is very wood dependent. So this is a huge, huge amount uh, of money. So and I think this, the modest salaries of researchers and graduate students to begin to address these problems uh, are well worth it. In fact, they should be giving these researchers more money to address these problems. Um, in the context of, of insect outbreaks in eastern Canada, there's another outbreaking species. If you want to talk about Lepidopteran defoliators or Lepidopteran outbreaking species, we do some research on those as well. But there's a species called the spruce budworm in eastern Canada, and its projected costs are between five and seven billion dollars in the next 40 years. Um, in New Brunswick alone, and the similar um, costs are expected in in Quebec. So, uh, what I'm hoping to convince you of here is that. Uh, uh, outbreaks of, of, of bark beetles are a, a fascinating ecological phenomena. They have significant consequences on forest health and significant consequences for human society. And so this is, this is why I'm very excited to, to examine these problems. Um, within this context, we assembled a large collaborative team and sort of this is a bit of a pitch for this research group that we put together to examine this problem of Mount Pine Beetle outbreak in Western Canada. This was a project funded by NSERC, which is our nas national funding agency. And the project was called TRIANET, Turning Risk into Action for the Mountain Pine Beetle Epidemic. Um, and this is the network of researchers from Western Canada all the way to me out here all by myself in the east at the University of, of Montreal. And this was a great uh, consortium of, of industry and government and universities. So we've got the provinces of Alberta, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. And this is, this is not super common for all these provinces to cooperate on a problem. Um, and we've got industry, Weyerhaeuser, West Fraser, um, and a bunch of uh, government and, and university research institutions. So this team was put together to address this problem and really understand what is it that's, what, what's driving this outbreak, what are the consequences, and perhaps what can we do in the future to reduce the economic consequences of the outbreak. So be before I go too much further into, uh, into the, the work we've been doing, and I guess the punchline is I'm, I'm going to talk about landscape genetics and landscape genomics. But first I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the organism. Um, if, if you guys don't know about bark beetles and their outbreak dynamics, they're incredibly interesting. They do all sorts of complicated things uh, in terms of chemical communication and aggregation and mass attacks to, to kill trees. Uh, so here we've got these galleries that females excavate under the bark of, of trees that they've been able to overcome. 
this is a, a lodgepole pine. Um, so these guys are under the bark. The trees don't accept this invasion of their, their subcortical uh, domain passively. They mobilize resins and lots of toxic chemicals to try to push the beetles out. Um, and I don't have a photo of it, but all through Western Canada, there are these uh, lodgepole pine trees that look like 100 people have stuck a wad of gum <laughs> on them. As, and these are these pitch tubes where they're trying to bleh, get rid of the, the beetle that's burrowed into the, the resin. And then the, the third part of the system is these uh, symbiotic fungi that are essential to killing these trees. They're these, these vectored ophiostomide fungi that come with the beetle. The females actually uh, inoculate the trees because they serve as nutrition for the developing larvae. So these fungi expand in the, the, the cambium of the, the tree uh, and they block the flow of nutrients. And this is what really, well, it's debatable, but it's what really kills the tree is this combined mechanical damage and the, the blocking of flow of nutrients and water within the tree. And then when you cut the tree down after it's dead, it's blue because the, that's the color of the fungus and it stains the wood blue. So it's this really fascinating dynamic. In the end, the trees die and that's bad. Um, what we have seen is this ongoing range expansion in the species. So these, these tripartite relationships, these three species interacting with one another, have resulted in, in an expansion into territory we've not seen before. And we have you know, genomic evidence or genetic evidence that there's a, a range expansion going on. This is a map of our study region in Western Canada, British Columbia and Alberta. Um, each of these circles represents a site where we collected between 20 and 30 mountain pine beetle individuals. They were uh, sequenced at, at a set of microsatellite loci for this particular example. And the warmer colors represent a high degree of heterozygosity and the greener is a low degree. And this is a pretty classic signature of an expansion into new, new territory. So we've got this range expansion ongoing and the populations are continuing to move not only, not only um, eastward into the forest resources in, in eastern Canada, but also northwards. Um, and this line here is 60 degrees north, the 60th parallel, and that's the border between British Columbia and uh, the Yukon Territories. And the uh, Mount Pine Beetle is successfully attacking and killing trees in Yukon Territory now as well, which is, as was never thought possible. Okay, so here's, there's the problem. Here's sort of what's going on. Um, in our lab, we take a landscape ecology and landscape genetics approach to examine these types of problems, to understand the spatial processes that are underlying these range expansion, these consequences for the forest. And I'm going to talk about two stories here. One is a landscape genetic story. And one is a landscape genomic story. Uh, for the uninitiated, uh, landscape genetics is a relatively new synthetic discipline that brings together ecology, spatial statistics, and population genetics to ask questions of what determines connectivity among populations. Um, and so usually we we examine landscape genetics using series of distance matrices. So I represent distance matrices here as triangles. So they're pairwise matrices. The triangle is just the lower, uh, lower part of the distance matrix. So that's the units, distances. In contrast, uh, we've got, I'll talk about a landscape genomics project, which looks at adaptive genetic variation. Whereas here we're talking about neutral genetic variation and, and differentiation among populations. Here we talk about local adaptation and usually we can represent those data as some sort of site by species matrix and then vectors of environmental predictors. So, you know, similar data, different objectives and different assumptions. Here we assume no adaptation, here we assume adaptation. So these are two approaches we're going to take to try to better understand this mountain pine beetle outbreak. So I'll, I'll start with this uh, landscape genetics project and it's, you know, it's we in the royal sense. It's actually the project of my PhD student, Julian. So he's done all this work, so I'll present it on our behalf and it's currently in review in the <coughs> Canadian Journal of Forest Research. Uh, so he started with, the, it's a relatively simple question of, of what environmental features actually influence genetic connectivity and, and gene flow. So how can it get from one place to the other? What might limit movement? What might what sort of constraints might these populations have recently overcome to expand as much as it has? Uh, and so we looked at this using a, a set of uh, 760 SNP loci. These were sequenced using the Golden Gate Gate platform from about 27 sites across Alberta and British Columbia. And we had a set of potential predictors that we looked at that, that we had a priori reasons to, to suspect played a role in connectivity. And these were elevation, pine volume, volume 
drought and climate suitability. And these are all, in one way or another, remotely sensed data products at this, this scale of the study area. So why do we care about the movement here? It's, it's honestly, we know not that much about mountain pine beetle movement. Um, they're actually not very good flyers. They're quite small. They don't have a lot of fat. They don't have a lot of lipids. They can't actively move very far. Uh, we know that they can, within a stand, they can orient and move themselves depending on pheromone plumes from trees. And they can be, there's a, a taxis where they'll move towards a tree that's already attacked by a few beetles. Um, but these, that scale of movement isn't really important for the outbreak dynamics. We, there are lots of records of them being able to move up to 400 kilometers um, in single events. And this is because they're passive flyers. Like many of these outbreaking species, they're very sensitive to barom barometric pressure. They'll do things like, um, if the barometric pressure drops, they'll start to fly upwards with the hope of being sucked up into an updraft, and they'll move with thunderclouds. And then when the clouds, when the rain comes, the beetles also fall out of the sky. Sometimes into, you know, cornfields, which is not very good, and sometimes into large mature stands of lodgepole pine, which is very good for them. So they have a complex, I mean, we'd say bimodal approach to dispersal, both local and long distance. But we don't really understand what it means, and we don't understand a whole lot about how the landscape might influence those dynamics. Um, ultimately, working with forest managers, provincial and industry, uh, if they want to reduce risk and start to forecast uh, outbreak spread and, and attack risk, risk into the future, we need to understand how far they're expected to move. So this is a fundamental component of, uh, of the, the pine beetle ecology and for management. Within the landscape genetics context, we usually try to specify some degree, some, some measure of landscape resistance. So if we, we can, so we can model genetic connectivity with landscape connectivity. The challenge is we often don't know how resistant a given landscape is to movement beforehand. This is sort of like, it's an output from the model, but we sort of want to use it as an input. Um, and here's this, this model of, of uh, the relationship between a genetic distance matrix and a bunch of predictor geographic distance matrices. We don't know how resistant a landscape should be. Um, right, so that's typically unknown. And we don't really know how to choose these costs. And so here's an example of resistance. Here's just a, a fictional landscape. The numbers represent how difficult we assume it is for a beetle to move through that pixel. So perhaps this is a mountain range. It's high elevation, so the beetle would avoid that. It's very expensive to move. Whereas this is nice, mature lodgepole pine, so this is very easy to move through. These values here I've chosen randomly. We don't actually know what these relative values should be to make a good, model of connectivity. And this, is, this has sort of been vexing the landscape, you call it landscape genetics field for a while. We don't know what it is we can do. We don't know how to parameterize these values. Um, Julian discovered, other people had come up with the solution, a method that uses something called linear mixed effects model with a maximum likelihood population effect and combine that with a genetic algorithm that actually optimizes the resistance surfaces uh, prior to constructing the model. So it's a machine learning technique that optimizes the resistance surface to build the most robust predictive model of genetic connectivity. So you can tell your friends that you saw a machine learning talk today. This is the method that he used. Um, we began by, by optimizing the resistance of each of those four potential predictors that we discussed. Elevation, pine volume, drought, and climate suitability. This is a, a synthetic climate measure. Um, this is the original environmental value, and this is the converted value. So for elevation and pine volume, we have very nice, mostly linear relationships between genetic connectivity and, or pardon me, resistance and the, the value, the original value of the predictor. So as elevation increases, resistance increases linearly. This is using the genetic data as a response. Pine volume, it decreases, so when you have more pine volume, you have less resistance. It's more easy to move through a high volume stand. Drought was very interesting. It had this unimodal curve. I'm not sure what this means yet, but so at intermediate levels of drought were the um, uh, most easy, most, pardon me, most difficult to move through. High drought was easy, low drought was easy. Uh, and finally, climate suitability had this nice, nice form. What this technique does, it basically permutes um, all possible combinations 
of, of shapes and sort of does this brute force algorithm and goes through and tests the fit of the genetic data to each one of these curves and then sort of ranks them on the log likelihood and you pick the best one at the end. Um, so these were the single surface optimizations and this is quite interesting. We didn't have this information. We don't have this relative uh, cost of movement based on these individual predictors. Um, but individual predictors aren't that useful. What we wanted was some sort of integrated uh, cohesive model of prediction that could could use that could integrate these multiple individual predictors into one single prediction and so we put together an optimized best composite surface and it uses the similar uh, brute force algorithm of going through and testing all the fits and then selecting the best model and what came out at the end was it's great it's not super exciting but it was an elevation and climate suitability are the strongest determinants of mountain pine beetle connectivity. And it was a 69% climate, 31% elevation. And then we can map that, and this is, this is what it looked like. So the warmer colors uh, indicate greater resistance to movement, and the uh, more light pink colors are uh, less resistant. Uh, so it's kind of, it's not a steady gradient. We found it was interesting that it had this sort of patchy structure. Um, but we, uh, but what this means for range expansion, we're not quite sure. But this is a map of resistance, how difficult it is for the pine beetle to move through this landscape on the basis of, of elevation and climate. So then the next obvious step with a resistance surface is to, to build a model of connectivity across that resistance surface. And we can use a tool called, called circuit theory to do that, where uh, this black part represents the most recent extent of mountain pine beetle tree damage. This is actual data. And then what we do is we set these as sort of like a, uh, an anode in an electrical circuit. And each pixel on these maps acts as an electrical resistor. The degree of resistance is proportional to the values represented here in this resistance surface. So you release the current. It all flows to an anode here or cathode here, which was the entire border. And we can look at these patterns of flow across the landscape. And what we were really hoping to find were um, many more uh, hot spots like this that could perhaps be used by management to target a spot where flow is expected to be directed. Um, unfortunately, we just found this one point, And otherwise, it's a bit of a wash. We'd say, like, everything seems equal. There are very little limitations to movement and connectivity here. And we thought, well, perhaps, perhaps this problem is that we, we built a model on elevation and climate in an area that's very mountainous, and then we apply it to an area that's very flat. So just for fun, we also ran the model using uh, predicting it based on pine volume alone, which we hypothesized would be a more limiting factor uh, in Saskatchewan. And as you can see, it was also a very we didn't really get much. And just I can I'll illustrate these differences. So this is British Columbia and Alberta. British Columbia, very mountainous, very rugged terrain. And this is where mountain pine beetle historically was. So we, we built our model, we parameterized our model using the data we had. Uh, but now we want to apply it in these areas, which have no mountains. That's sort of like breaking that law that your stats teacher told you. You don't build a regression model using some data and then apply it somewhere else, but this is actually the nature of the problem, is we, want, we, need, we need to be able to apply it elsewhere. So we're not really sure what to do, because I, I think although this is interesting and it's a useful tool, it's not a very good model to predict movement into these eastern areas, but we don't, we don't have the information to build a good model in those areas. So we're, we're still working on this. Um, it could just be that, well, we need to come up with different strategies for for managing future spread, perhaps targeting only high value stands or, or, or other approaches. But um, <coughs> the model of connectivity with all of that work tells us that everything is quite connected and we might need to take different approaches. Okay, so that's the landscape genetics story. Um, we can move into a landscape genomics story and specifically a story about something that I've called well, is called landscape community genomics. So here's the, the figure that I showed you earlier of in a genomics context, we'd have adaptive loci in a site by species matrix, very much like community data. And we try to model them as a function of multiple environmental predictors. 
Uh, when it becomes a community genomics project, we have multiple other species involved and we're trying to model this community of genomic information as a function of multiple environmental predictors. Um, this sort of builds on earlier work on, um, by Thomas Whitnam on this, this notion of extended phenotypes. Um, I was really inspired by this and we published a paper in 2011 um, on uh, what, what I called multi-taxa integrated landscape genetics. So, and that was using one, the genetic structure of one species to try to predict the connectivity of another species. So if you think about the models I just showed you, in addition to elevation and pine, we would add the genetic structure of another species to that, to those connectivity matrices and model that. Uh, so big mouthful, multi-tax integrated landscape genetics. And then Brian Hand came along and made this really great paper called Landscape Community Genomics, which I think is a much catchier title than this one. And I regret I didn't think of that title first. Uh, but uh, there's this body of work that's developing right now that is interested in connecting multiple species genomic data and environmental context to model eco-evolutionary dynamics. So I'm going to show you one of my attempts at this, um, addressing this type of a problem. So within the, the context of the mountain pine beetle outbreak, uh, I've been very interested in whether uh, rapid evolution is a contributing factor to this rapid range expansion. Is it just the environment that has changed? Has the, have the populations of beetles changed? Have both changed? Um, is evolution involved? Uh, there are some suggestions that that, that might be the case. Uh, so the objective here was to, to search for groups of potentially adaptive loci among species that cluster together. So not just evolution within one species, but evolution within the system. Because all these parts fit together, the beetle, the tree, and the fungi. And each have very complex um, genomic interactions with their environment that can influence the capacity to, to kill trees. So we're searching for what I call outbreak syndrome. So an outbreak syndrome would be a, a group of genomic markers interspecies that facilitate success in one area or another. So yeah, spatially structured interspecies associations of adaptive alleles. And I'll just remind you here we're talking about adaptive variation, so we're focused on genetic variation at spatial locations rather than genetic variation between, between locations. Okay, and why do we care? So our goal is to improve our understanding of these eco-evolutionary dynamics for outbreaks and range expansion. And I mentioned already, the big question is rapid evolution driving system dynamics and, and range expansion. So I'll take a moment, I'll, I'll sort of define this strange uh, idea of the outbreak syndromes. Um, so if we, if we can simply imagine that there are two species we're considering two species, a beetle and a fungus, each of which have two genotypes. Um, under our neutral model, where, where there is no rapid evolution, we would expect to see equal frequencies of these, fre equal frequencies of combinations of these genotypes among species. So all four are represented in the east, all four are represented in the west. In contrast, if there is some sort of selective dynamic going and, and, and facilitating this range expansion, we might see a genotype that's suited to the core or pair of genotypes suited to the core of the population, whereas it, we'll see a different set of genotypes at the periphery. And the correlation with this pair of genotypes at the periphery might suggest to us that there's something advantageous about this combination of loci or these, this combination of genomic information at the leading edge that's letting them expand, letting them overcome uh, historical constraints. Okay, so, this is, so these, these are what I would call an outbreak syndrome, a combination of, uh, of genotypes. So within this large uh, uh, tree and net research project, you know, we, we had access to this huge amount of data. I, had, I didn't touch a pi single pipette for the generation of all of these wonderful genomic resources, uh, but I was fortunate enough to get to work with them. Um, so we had you know, about 200 individuals for the beetle, Three species of fungus, it's actually, it's not a single species, it's a community of fungi itself. Uh, Grossmania clavigera, longi Leptographium longiclavatum, and Ophiostomia montium. And finally, genetic information for the, the pine trees as well. Um, if you're interested in more details about this genomic information, these data, how it was sequenced, I'm happy to answer any questions about it. So we start with these data, and then we, we have this pipeline. And the punchline here for the pipeline is, 
This is an old problem in community ecology. Community ecologists have often wanted to know, do we find non-random spatial structure in groups of species? Do I find a community over here and a community over here? And what are those differences? What drives them? This is the, the, pretty well the exact same question, but here instead of individual species, we're using uh, uh, SNP loci, SNP markers. Okay, we're looking for non-random associations of SNPs, not just within species, but then uh, among species. So we had these genomic resources. The first step was to identify potentially uh, adaptive loci, so outliers. So we did a genome scan method. We used a tool that's called latent factor mixed models. Uh, we selected our putatively adaptive loci on the basis of latitude only. Uh, and then we merged. So for each species, we identified a set of potentially adaptive loci. So you can imagine it would just be a, um, a site by species table for each species. And then we just smushed them together into some sort of one large meta organism uh, of putatively adaptive loci. And this was our response matrix. And, and once you have a matrix like this, you can start to use all of the community ecology tools, vegan and R, all of these tools that exist to manipulate community data. But now we're using SNP frequencies instead. Um, so yes, we merge them into a single genomic table. Uh, we cluster the outlier loci based on the frequency of occurrence among sites. And then we assess the significance of these clusters using you know, a really classic approach, a Kendall's W test. And this was something produced by Pierre Legendre, or, or described by Pierre Legendre in 2005. And I understand he'll be here soon for the Iberian Ecological Society meeting. Um, so he described this for identifying uh, clusters of species, and we just borrowed it and applied it to identifying clusters of loci. And then we did some ordination to uh, explore, explore the relationships. So following uh, our genome scan, we identified about 10 to 15 potentially adaptive loci per species. Uh, and then I built this simple clustering tree. This is just using a Ward's algorithm. Um, and we identified these cut points that were significant. And then we assessed the significance of these clusters against a permutation test. And what we see here is we've got a first group that is almost, that is exclusively fungi. These are the adaptive loci found in fungal species grouped together. These, this is a group of adaptive loci that are from beetles and from pine trees that group together. And here's a group of adaptive loci that group together in terms of uh, beetle and fungi. So we identified three groups of interspecies, well, one inter, two intra-species associations of adaptive loci. And these were all significant, applying the Kendall's W criterion. And we can visualize what these clusters mean. So each cluster is varying geographically in a different way. So here's, it's not in order, because I had trouble with R. This is group three, the beetle and fungus cluster. And this, is the, this, this represents all of the loci that were included in that cluster. And this is how their frequencies of those loci change going from south to north. Okay, so we see this increase allele frequency in this cluster going from south to north. The be pine beetle and uh, pine tree is kind of flat, has this funny shape to it. And this is the third group that is only fun fungus. It's this spatial variation that is being picked up by this clustering algorithm. So we see three different uh, adaptive genomic syndromes across the study region. Okay? So this, this, is, this is the actual difference. Some, low, some adaptive loci increase with going north, some stay the same, and some have some other strange pattern. So then, okay, so we've got these clusters. We plotted them out in the principal components analysis, and this was done a bit in a funny way. And normally with a PCA, we do it in a uh, an R mode where we, we model the sites as a function of species occurrences. This was reversed and we modeled species occurrences as a function of occurrence in sites. So it's a Q mode ordination, if you guys are familiar with that. You just transpose the matrix. Um, and so the colors represent the three, uh, the, the, the three clusters we had identified before. The black are our sites that correspond to this area. We can't see them that well, but I've circled the site Velmont right in the middle in red, and that's in the middle. And it seems, to be a, it seems to be a division between the groups of sites. And we see it in the north, we have a so geographic association with the uh, 
pine and beetle cluster. And then in the south, we have this beetle fungus cluster as well as the more so the, the fungal cluster. And I, and I appreciate that this is descriptive and it's a bit hand wavy. Um, working on better techniques to quantitatively describe these relationships. But in any case, I'm quite pleased with this result because it does show that there's some spatial structure to these clusters of adaptive loci, which gives some support to the idea that there might be some evolutionary processes involved at the leading edge of the outbreak that are helping it, helping it succeed. So, with this approach, I identified some significant inter- and intraspecific clusters of outlier, outlier loci. These clusters show some fidelity to the known expansion axes. And so therefore, this is a big caveat, big may. Outbreak expansion may be in part due to spatial evolutionary dynamics among species. And this, this approach, this framework, I really think could be applied to lots of other multi-species systems that might have expansion or might have a spatial variation in the strength and nature of interactions among species that determine uh, persistence and, and success. So I'd like to see this applied. We've talked with some folks working on Lyme disease and uh, uh, mice and deer in Canada, and there's work on sea lice that I think could benefit from some of this approach once we sort of iron out some more details. So a few caveats, of course, is we don't actually know if these loci are adaptive. We didn't do functional genomic characterization. This is based on genome scan. It's correlative. So further functional characterization is required. Uh, there are lots of problems with identifying loci under selection using genome scans uh, because of allele surfing during range expansion. And allele surfing is a phenomenon where simply through random chance, non-adaptive loci can become fixed at the leading edge of an outbreak and produce clines in genetic variation that are strictly neutral but they will look identical to an adaptive pattern. And this is really common with rapidly expanding populations. Um, and we've got some, some, a couple of students working on this problem right now. Uh, again, these are correlative. We don't know the ev eco-evolutionary mechanisms. And uh, there are potentially confounding effects of induced spatial dependence. So the environment could be causing these loci to behave in the same way rather than actual evolutionary processes. So, I think in the end I have more problems than solutions and more questions than answers, but um, I'm excited that we're making some progress on this. So finally, I'm, we're still talking with collaborators and industry and government and trying to find better additional ways that we can take this information and uh, apply it to the outbreak and better understand future risks. At this point, the outbreak has sort of worn itself out here. Um, there's still concern in Saskatchewan. But most of this work was motivated by the idea in the future, 30, 40 years, when there's the next outbreak, where should we build the mills to most effectively treat the lumber that's going to be killed? So with that, I will thank uh, the big team of collaborators. And like I said, this is a, uh, was a really big project with a lot of people. And I sort of just received the end product of literally dozens of people's work and got to play with these data and put them together in, in novel ways. So uh, I acknowledge the help of all of these folks and, and um, NSERC, Trianet, University of Montreal, University of Alberta for funding. And if you are interested in other stuff we're doing or any of this other work, there are more details. You can find it on our lab website right there. Thank you very much. Yes. Anybody is very useful. But now, can you think of uh, doing some kind of experiment to prove that there is some kind of co-evolution? Yeah. Because you have uh, fungi, you have uh, beetles, they are short lived. Yep. So you can manage probably to, to get some connection in a beautiful way. Yes. So, yeah, I, I suppose the sort of like the defense question, isn't it? Uh, it's a good one. I think that we. In lab, we could, uh, we could rear beetles and fungi from different provenances, and then we could search for 
qPCR or look for the transcriptomes of of, of different suspected loci. There, there is some work with collaborators in particular at the University of British Columbia, it's not listed here, um, uh, looking at P450s in a bunch of these species and trying to see how they're expressed differentially depending on rearing environment. Um, but I think selecting individuals from these different provenances and actually trying to see, I mean again that's only describing each individual species uh, gene expression profile. Uh, the question of are there selective pressures being imposed, reciprocal selection pressures being imposed, I'm not exactly sure yet, but that would be a really excellent thing to, to be able to do. The whole picture. Yeah. You know, the, the thing about the special scale and correlation. Uh, yes. It's the, the pattern you're looking for, really, for sure. Yes, yeah. It's a good question. Yeah, I'll think about it. Did you have a question as well? Yes. Yeah. Um, so those samples are based on British Columbia and Alberta. Yes. Then, so if you like to use it as some kind of um, uh, strategic planning for the East, Can East, uh, East Canada, Eastern Canada, do you think that this can be some kind of a reference point, or we should have to repeat the same methodology to samples because it's it's a jackpot, right? Right. Yeah. So yeah. So as that's that's a great point. So as so here's the edge of the lodgepole pine distribution, and then it's jack pine. So people are really just starting to touch the question of what does this outbreak look like in jack pine. We've, it's been demonstrated that they can reproduce successfully in jack pine. Jack pine is a very different species though. The, um, like the cambium isn't as thick, it has a very different terpene profile, and, and it's very... It, it might not be as affected. In terms of the fungi, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how they behave differently in this tree. They do inoculate, they do take root, they establish in the jack pine, but what their, how their life history might be different, uh, the reproductive rates, their ability to kill the tree, um, we don't know because there are so few natural instances of being able to observe this. And not surprisingly, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Ontario are not very interested in us coming in and inoculating trees experimentally in this area. So most of it is lab work on seedlings. Uh, how these behave in large mature trees is, is still somewhat uncertain, but I, I, think, I think that's a really <coughs> great question as well. This can be used as some kind of resistance services tools. Right. Right, so I mean, this is, this is where they would be normally. And they did this, okay, historically. But this is, this is, this is bananas, like this is not, has not been observed. So in your experience, you don't think they are willing to take that data from the West, Western Canada? So it's, it's really a, a huge ongoing problem, is that we have, and mountain pine beetle has been big business in Western Canada for 60 years. There's a huge body of literature. Um, it's very challenging to work. I was a relative newcomer because so many people have worked on mountain pine beetle for so long and the depth of knowledge is so great. Um, but this depth of knowledge might be mostly irrelevant now as we move into this new area. And, and I mean, sort of on, as an aside, it's sort of an example of, of like modern global change driven ecological phenomena. What we thought we knew we don't know anymore, or we'd say it's an all bets are off scenario, that it, it might behave so differently and we don't have the historical context. So we hope that some of this information, some of the models that have been developed can be applied, but there are still, I think, significant challenges to parameterizing those models in the new, new environment. I think there's a huge amount of work to be done, a lot of opportunities for students. I, I, I enjoyed very much your talk, thanks. Thank you. Uh, I like the, on the first part of the talk, the, this uh, electrical uh, circuit analogy you applied yes. to, to estimate the connectivity of the landscape scale. 
And I, I found these results, which you find this very sort of small area of, of risk, let's say, of, of the penetration of the, of the beetle, quite intriguing. And I would like to know, so you had, you were modeling this as a function of elevation and climate suitability? Yes, correct. So what exactly is this climate suitability? I mean, is it something constant? Have you applied some sort of climate change scenario to predict right. the likely pathways? Or how did you do that? Right, so the, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. The climate suitability index is something that uses historical climate normals. Mm -hmm. And it's a bit of a synthetic index that brings in um, I believe it's m minimum winter temperature, average seasonal temperature, uh, maybe a precipitation index, and they all get folded into a model that predicts the r that was used to predict the rate of beetle development. So it's sort of like the most suitable climatic conditions for beetle development, uh, but it includes mostly temperature, it includes temperature and precipitation, and it's based on the normal, meaning it's a 30-year period uh, that would have been. For this one, from 1980 to 2010. Now, the climate change question is definitely relevant uh, to project what connectivity might look like as you go further into the future or into the past. Um, we've not yet done that, but I, I think that it could be interesting. And lots of landscape genetic studies have looked at how historical conditions might actually describe current levels of connectivity better than uh, current landscape structure. Try to see whether you can reproduce the, the path of invasion. Yes. Quite exciting. Yes. <laughs> Excuse me. Following the comment by Jordi, I would like to ask you what is the contribution of altitude once you have discounted the effects of climate? Because we always think that there is a close relationship yeah. between uh, climate features and altitude. So I, I, I was a little bit uh, surprised or. Uh, or, or I was trying to figure out which could be the effect of altitude out of climate in this, in this pattern. Yes, so you're entirely correct that these are going to be, they're, they're correlated. And all, all of the predictors that we looked at are actually quite correlated. And this is this pain that we have in spatial ecology, right? Everything is sort of similar to each other. Um, so the weighting here, elevation accounted for 31% of the predictive capacity and climate was 69. And these would be orthogonal components of variance to that description. But when, I mean, th these final models were selected on the basis of an uh, information criterion, so an AIC. We went with this as the best, but the next best model might have had a delta AIC of four or five. And then there was another two after that, and the three. So many of the models are very similar because of this degree of correlation among, among predictors. Go, go ahead. Yeah. Um, are there any natural pests or diseases of the pine beetles that keep them in check? Yes, no. <laughs> so yes, there are natural enemies. There is a an interesting community of uh, uh, parasitoid wasps and flies, uh, mostly parasitoids that uh, you know find them under the bark and overposit through the bark. Uh, they're not really thought to have a significant role in the population dynamics, not during the outbreak phase. Now, quite literally in the last year or two, people have been writing more papers about this, uh, but that uh, these parasitoids have a stronger influence at the declining and incipient phase of the outbreak. So it's sort of like a classic tritrophic escape context. But they're less important than climate and host availability uh, than it is for other uh, outbreaking forest insect pests. So outrunning their pests isn't part of this? Not a huge part of it, no, we don't think so. Mostly climate and host availability. Uh, you gave us that picture of these beetle guys going up to the air and riding a storm and going yeah. hundreds or thousands of miles away. So this long distance dispersal um, shouldn't make any management effort worthless. Sure, and sure, they just fly over it, and right? And the study of uh, connectivity and resistance is relative yeah. to what it can. But again, I mean, if uh, this is the case and these insects are not in farther places, yep. that means that there may be other factors yep. than resistant surfaces to get to yep. these places. Exactly. So 
So if we have like a, a dispersal kernel, right, where you've got a probability and a distance, this sort of describes most movement in, in these outbreaking insects. So the long distance stuff is out here. It's infrequent, but it's of high consequence, yeah. right? So what I suspect is the connectivity work here, and maybe I should explain that earlier in the presentation next time I share it with you, is that, um, you know, this, this work probably applies in this part of the curve. And, but you're absolutely right. There is nothing management can do to overcome these long-distance dispersal events. We, we don't really know the relative contributions and the relative importance to genetic structure and outbreak dynamics. And it is, it's an outstanding question, most definitely. What I can say is that um, Julian is currently the student working very hard on finding ways to incorporate um, wind fields as a predictor in this, this connectivity model. So to capture this portion of the dispersal kernel using wind vectors. Now, when you get into wind, does anyone work on wind in here? It's really hard. Yeah. It's hard. <laughs> because it's this three-dimensional resistance surface now, and it's directional. So whereas, you know, I was able to use simple triangles to represent distance matrices, when you get into a directional process like wind, it's asymmetric. So there's a lower triangle, and an upper triangle, and they're no longer the same. And we don't have, as far as I know, really the tools to do multivariate analysis with asymmetric paired distance matrices. And that's, that's actually the, one of the thesis topics for, for Julian, is how to bring wind into this. So you're absolutely right. Like this, this makes resistance modeling on the surface kind of irrelevant. But it doesn't happen all the time. <coughs> it happens sometimes. If it is the only thing that matters, then this is a waste of time. But I suspect that it's a combination of the two that will help us understand these movement patterns. No more questions? Okay, thank you. Patrick. Thank you, everyone.